our natural state is to be in motion. Sitting is described as the new smoking uh, and twice as bad for us as obesity. Think about how it feels. If you've been sitting very still for a long period of time, sometimes even just a few minutes, you can feel that physical restlessness, discomfort, even actual pain, which tends to result in you having to get up and move around. And that's just a reflection of the fact that actually we're made to move. And you can't outrun a sedentary lifestyle. There's good evidence to show that uh, if you have a sedentary job, you're much better trying to make movement a natural part of your day. For example, walking to work, taking the stairs, um, drinking plenty of fluid, getting up and taking toilet breaks, walking around during the day. That's actually better for you than sitting still all day and going to the gym for an hour at the end of the day to, to blast it off. And you don't stop moving because you get old. You get old because you stop moving. If movement were invented today by a pharmaceutical company, it would undoubtedly be considered a wonder drug. It's a miracle cure for many of the long-term conditions that ail us and indeed a way of preventing most of them occurring. It has physical benefits, it has social benefits, it has mental health benefits, particularly if you combine it with being outdoors in nature or socialising with others. One of the problems is that people often use words that maybe aren't so attractive to describe it, like exercise, which sounds vaguely military and unpleasant. And I like to describe it to my patients just as physical activity or movement. And when I encourage people to think about what they can do with their lives and what they could do differently, I encourage people to think not so much of adding in something which might seem forced, unnatural, or perhaps not entirely enjoyable, but actually how can they just restore movement to its natural place in your life that it always should have been, but for whatever reason we have suppressed in the way that our world is engineered today. So one of the things I'd encourage you to think about as we move into watching this next short video is what do you do and what would you like to do more of? So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, uh, weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What has the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? Um, so I did my research and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50%. For patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions, it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58%. Following over 10,000 Harvard alumni for over 12 years, those that had the intervention had a 23% lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment. It's the number one treatment of fatigue and of course the kind of outcome of choice there, my favorite outcome is quality of life which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better and this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons and, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm... Um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day so there's 24 hours and so you might spend most of your day you know this varies obviously but uh, you know couch surfing sitting at work obviously sleeping mm -hmm. and what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active maybe an hour and that uh, if you can do that you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides so if exercise is a medicine what's a dose so when I think of, of, of dose I think of how long how often and how intense I'm gonna give you a slightly mixed message but essentially uh, more activity is better but I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more if you're a kid, an hour a day if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that um, 
you know, the literature draws a very broad brush. Uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something. And after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week, uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down. So it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise. So it can be broken into three. If you're only going to do it, if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease we know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this, and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But... Um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So whether it's hitting the gym and attaining fitness goals or walking the dog or taking the stairs, get out there and be active. Thanks again to 24 Hour Fitness for bringing you this message. One of the questions that people often ask me is, how much physical activity should I do? And there are guidelines. The chief medical officer talks about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity or 75 minutes a week of higher intensity. What do we mean by moderate? Well, for example, a brisk walk, something that gets your heart rate up, your breathing rate up, makes you feel a bit warm, a bit sweaty, slightly out of breath, able to talk, but perhaps not in a long sentence. And by higher intensity, I mean things like running, uh, more rapid cycling, say an aerobic workout, for example. But there are lots of other options as well that people might consider that they would maybe find more easy to do or would consider more natural, such as um, cycling or walking to work, getting off the bus or the tube a stop or two early, taking the stairs more, particularly at work if you, if you have a building with lifts in it, and getting out more, uh, socialising, being physically active with other people, pandemic permitting, of course. Of course, you know, the gym has a, a purpose and lots of people do love the gym, the equipment, the gear, the sociability, the environment, etc. And if that if that works for you, then great. Other people might prefer gardening, walking the dog, doing something that they see as pleasurable, like uh, dancing, for example, or going for a swim. The most important thing to remember is that movement is accessible to everyone and anyone. And it's about starting from where you are and going to the next step. Like any miracle drug, it has a dose response curve. And by that, I mean the people who will benefit the most are those who go from being inactive to just mildly active. So let's say people who just move off the couch and literally take the first few steps to walking five to 10 minutes a day, they will get the biggest incremental gain in terms of reduction of illness and likelihood of a premature death. As we become more physically active and our levels of activity go up and up, as they often do when we're encouraged and we enjoy physical activity, those gains do exist, but they are incrementally smaller. And ultimately people who run ultra marathons and climb mountains, quite apart from the risk of injury, once they've done more than about 30 minutes of moderate activity a day, they're probably not going to live any longer. So the most important thing is to find something which is enjoyable and sustainable, because if this is the case, then it's more likely to stick.